understanding of Psalm 24. I'll do my best not to stay with the exigencies of that scripture. I'm good to see you, sir. Good to see you. Praise God. I'll do my best not to sit with the exigencies of that particular scripture. Ah, oh, good to see you, man. You know the face mask has a way of masking everybody. <laughs> good to see everyone. Ah, Pastor ID. She's well. We'll discuss personal matters later. I really missed everyone. Sometimes collecting the fire of God does something to you. It makes that you don't own yourself anymore. You are bred broken to nations. And many things you want to do at a personal level, you don't even have the luxury of because of the life that you have chosen to lay down upon God's altar. It is now his life, so he does with it as he pleases. I sat down while, while Tiffany was speaking, and I, I, just, I, I was stretching my body back and forth. Because I figured out that I had eight takeoffs and landings in the last two days. Eight. I did four takeoffs and landings to arrive at Gambia, and I was whisked straight into the meeting. And the Holy Ghost didn't have mercy upon me. I landed at 7 p.m. I was leaving the microphone at 8.30 p.m. I gave them back the microphone at 12 midnight. Then we came back the second day and did the same thing. And I gave them back at 12 midnight and forgot that I had a 5 a.m. flight. So by the time we were done, I was literally just moved to take a bath and to the airport. And did another four flights back to Lagos yesterday. So when I came, I was wasted. I looked like a piece of vegetable. I woke up this morning. I was trying to find my body. You know, have you ever woken up and you're checking the sides of the bed? Where did I drop my body last night? You know? <laughs> Praise God. And so I was, I was really literally very tired, you know, throughout the morning. That's the reason why I sat. It's not my custom. Customarily, I stand when everybody stands. Because it is before the presence of the Father that we stand. Amen. Praise God. I said that so that nobody says, Pastor Chintok came and he was sitting down. So I have the right to sit down. But sitting down as a man of God for the hour. With the power to cower every devil's sour. That has come to turn the people's lives sour. Amen. Glory. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. But I believe it is redemption time. And God is calling us around redemption. Like I said, let me do Psalm 24 quickly. Now, in Psalm 24, you find God laying a claim upon the earth. All right? I've got, I've got messages on that, and, and possibly I'll make that available. He's laying a claim upon the earth. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the worlds and they that dwell therein. Now, when God makes that kind of a claim, it seems to be a reminder. Because when the earth, Pastor Nigel, is going in directions that God doesn't want it to go. Now, let me, let me state something very clearly. I wish Tommy was around or something. He would have been able to deal with that session more, you know, easily. Listen to me. In understanding the prophetic, you must understand the prophetic within the, within the full confines of the will of God and the sovereignty of God. If you don't understand it that way, you will get up and accuse prophets for things that they don't have accusations for. Listen, the will of God is always the best good of the people. It's always the best good of the people. So when a people stand in any circumstance, Tiffany, God is telling them what's, what their best good is. It's like God saying in Joshua, I lay before you um, life and death. He said, but I counsel you to choose life that you may live. The reason why it is often like that is because the earth he has already given to the sons of men. Whatever the sons of men do with the earth, he does not intervene except if he is called in by those who have a covenant with him. That's the reason why in Psalm 110, I hope I'm not moving too, too fast. That's the reason why in Psalm 110, when scripture began to speak about God coming to reign on the earth, Psalm 110 began by saying, what? What, what, what did this time I say? Psalm 110 verse 1. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Psalm 110. One, so, come on, I thought there was a Bible student somewhere around. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Now, notice that Psalm 110 began from the point when Jesus resurrected because this declaration was only made after Jesus brought back his blood to the Father. Is that all right? Come on, saints. Is that all right? So, sit down at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Meaning from this point onward, the battle is not going to be with you, Jesus, in person. I'm going to handle it. Right? Then verse 2. He said, give me verse 2 on the board. Give me verse 2. 
The Lord. So how are you going to make all my enemies my footstool? The Lord will send the rod of your strength out of Zion with one mandate only. Rule in the midst. So God will not bring down your enemies. He will cause you to rule in their midst. All right? But this is how he's going to do it. He's going to send the rod of your strength. Meaning, when you operated before you came to the right hand of the Father to submit all authority and all rule, and you had the declaration, sit at my right hand. When that operation was going on, there was a rod of your strength. Ooh, let's, not take it, let's not make it mystical. The rod of your strength is actually the Holy Spirit. How God anointed Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit and with power. Who went about doing good, healing all them that were oppressed of the devil because God. So the moment Jesus sat at the right hand of the Father, you remember he told them, when I go to heaven, I'm going to ask the Father and he will send you. That means what gave Jesus the authority and the right to do the things he did before he died was the Holy Spirit. So God was saying, I'm going to take care of the rest of the job. You're not going to need to go back there anymore. Just sit here and watch your enemies become your footstool. But how are we going to achieve that? I will cause the rod by which you operated when you were here to proceed now, but out of a different place. It's called Zion. And to understand that, you've got to go to Hebrews chapter 12. This is not my subject today, so I'm going to do that. I'm just good. You are coming to Zion, the city of the living God. To an innumerable company of angels in joyful assembly, the spirit of judgment made perfect, and all that, all of that. Jesus, uh, Jesus Christ, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of the sprinkling that speaks better things than the blood of Abel. And ultimately, you find in Hebrews chapter 12, and time permits us, we're going to come back there today. Ultimately, you find in Hebrews chapter 12 that the essence of the speaking blood was to cause a shaking upon the earth. We're going, we will come back here. I, today is a buffet, right? It means you came ready, right? And today is Sunday. We can give God this one. This one Sunday. Can we give him? Can we give him this one Sunday? All right. All right. You are setting yourself up. Oh. Just in case you didn't say yes. Better indicate now. Let me know. So that we can put you somewhere around the door. Praise God. Because you see. Let me, let me say something sincerely from my heart. I don't teach for long because I love to teach for long. You need to know the consequence of my body most times when I'm done. Many times it's because there's a, there's a pang in me to see the church arrive at understanding. Till today when I see the kind of arguments the church is involved in. The church in America just came out of the election. And you had a sharp rift. A very sharp rift. In the church in America. Just like we had a very sharp rift in the church in Nigeria in 2015. And you know, we discuss politics like we're talking football. We, we think that we're dealing with Manchester and Arsenal here. And so, oh, finally, Biden is president. Well, it's all right. We'll just play the game. Yeah. <laughs> it's the destiny of the earth we're talking about like that. Some things are more consequential than others. This is not a bet. It's not you win, I lose. You know, you remember that initially what brought me to this scripture is that I'm trying to say to you that there is two dimensions of the prophetic you must understand. Prophetic according to the will of God, which is always the best intent of God concerning any people. And then there's the prophetic according to the sovereignty of God because he knows that ultimately the people will still do what they want to do. Not because that's what he intends to bring to pass. And you know how merciful God is. When we make our choices, he goes back on the drawing board to see how to make that choice as easy as possible for us, even though many times it doesn't come easy. Like President Boo. <laughs> just, just pretend you didn't hear that part. Amen. I guess you still remember before the elections in 2015 we shouted 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 God gave me a direct analogy from scripture and I gave it everywhere I went how they have not arrested me till tomorrow is a miracle it's a, it's a miracle I'm ready for it every day I move out I move out ready 
in case. Because the word of the Lord has to be declared. And the word of God cannot be declared on the basis of diplomacy or political correctness. Some people don't understand the responsibility that comes with standing in the very presence of God to receive a word from his mouth. You, you don't understand the responsibility. That's why sometimes God's prophets will speak and you will lift it from the realm of the prophetic into the realm of logic and then use it as a basis for argument because you are very wise. And yet you heard Tiffany, she quoted a scripture this morning. God uses the foolish thing. And it is not entirely our fault. We ended up in a, prophet, in, in a generation of prophets who borrow words from each other's mouth and have not heard God. We've ended up in a generation of prophets who prophesy to protect their best interest, not to speak the heart of God. It's part of the reasons why the consecrations that it takes to stand in the prophetic there's no prophet in the Old Testament that didn't look mad at some level. There are some things you cannot mix up with. There are certain allegiances you cannot hold. Because the moment you begin to hold them, they corrupt the word of the Lord in your mouth. I say that painfully with all sense of responsibility. I stand in a generation that can literally just look upward and see men who began declaring the word of the Lord until they arrived at certain levels of loyalties or allegiances. And it didn't begin with us. There are stories in the Old Testament. Oh, she touched something just before Ahab died. You know, she was reading some Kings chapter 3. And I just sat down. And I was just falling in love with this babe, you know. We didn't get that part. Just leave me that part. Some of you don't laugh in church. That's the reason why I do where you are. <laughs> Whatever we say, you cannot laugh. The atmosphere is too serious. Pastor, go on, go on, go on. Okay, I refuse. Is he your go on? It's my go on. I'm not going. Let me go on. You know, she picked up a story in 7 Kings chapter 3. The story of Ahab's son. Well, just before, you know, before Ahab's, Ahab himself was eliminated by God. Because he was eliminated by God. God took him. You saw a situation. And in saying this, I'm saying this so that you be careful in what leanings you lean, especially when it comes to the prophetic. Especially when it has to do with dire decisions that have got strong consequences for the earth and God's church. And so Ahab and Jehoshaphat, the same Jehoshaphat, were going to war. And they sat down, the Bible said, in their kingly apparels, and they sat in a chariot. And Jehoshaphat said to Ahab, is there no prophet that we can inquire of the Lord from? You can see that the same principle was what he was using in 2 Kings chapter 3, when he said again, is there no prophet around here? We are, listen, in, in every fix, look for a prophet or a prophetic word. Look for it. That's not my subject today, it's redemption. It's easy that it's tormenting me now. Every time I want to go out of this subject, and now here I go again. Redeeming creation. Pastor Tim said, okay, redeeming creation. Okay, we will redeem creation. <laughs> Praise God. And so, <laughs> so they sit in their kingly apparel, and then they call for prophets. And it took a king to ask a fallen king, is there no other prophet? No, you didn't hear me. How does a king understand the operation of the prophetic better than the prophets, the leading prophets of a time? Because he was the one who said to the other king, Jehoshaphat said to Ahab, is there no other prophet? And almost all the prophets in town had finished prophesying. I said in a meeting in 2015, I said I'm not comfortable with any of the sides of the prophetic, whether the prophetic for Jonathan or the prophetic for Buari, because what I am hearing is not a prophetic from thus said the Lord, it's a prophetic from interest. So even though God had a position, even those who were standing with God were not standing with God for God, they were standing with God for interest. Now I'm not saying everyone. Please, 
the work of discernment is left for you. Ah, how did I get there? And then Ahab said, there's one guy. He doesn't like me. He never says anything good about me. What is there that is good to say about Ahab? There's a president I know. Whether in the flesh or in the spirit, I know not. There also is nothing good. Did you miss that line? Okay. Did you miss that line? Are you following? And then they bring this prophet. And he stands and puts, us, puts on the best sarcastic face he could get in town. And he looks at both of them and says, God, God is with you. <laughs> then Jehoshaphat says, man of God, I beg you, don't lie to me. And then he says, oh, Jehoshaphat, why? You just broke my decoy. I, I was just cooperating with God to do his will. He said, God, I, I was taken up into heaven this morning. And I saw the Lord seated in his glory. And God was looking for who will help him solve his puzzle. Who will send Ahab to war for me so that I can kill him? No, God, God Almighty, called for a meeting in heaven. I said, somebody give us a strategy. We need to kill Ahab today. I need to kill him. And then all the angels were suggesting things until one came. He said, I know what to do. God said, what will you do? He said, look at the prophets in the city. They already love their gain. So I will become a lying spirit. And I will sit in the mouth of all of these prophets. They, when they prophesy to him, he will go. Then the lead prophet, the most senior man of God in Israel, stepped out and slapped the young prophet and told him, which way did the Holy Ghost pass me? To reach you. No, 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 no. Some stories are too interesting. Let me go back. I only said that to say that you, you must be careful about your prophetic leanings. All right? But, so Psalm 110, please give me back Psalm 110. So how are we going to get this done? I will send the word of your strength to proceed from out of Zion with one mandate. Rule thou in the midst of of your enemies. Then he said something I always like to call our attention to in verse 3. He said, your people will be willing in the day of your power. Now, I always like to call our attention, please hear this, because this is going to be very vital to what I'm going to teach you today. Every time the day of his power comes, there are principles that must be in place from out of his people that qualifies the people to now be called a willing people because God will not go beyond his church to do what he wants to do in the earth. Now you can tell that this is a prophetic scripture because it began with the resurrection of Jesus, right? And this was the psalmist writing years before that resurrection, all right? So your people will be willing. There are two that come very easy for me so that it just helps you understand the willingness and the day of his power. Somebody say the day of his power. That's the prophetic. Then somebody say, his people will be willing. That's the principle. Are you with me? Are you with me? Okay, so I'll give you a principle. For instance, God picked out a day on the day when they were leaving um, Egypt and he called it the Passover, right? And he made them do a feast with a one-year-old spotless lamb. You remember that entire story? And that, of course, was prophetic of the death of Jesus. Is that correct? Yes. Come on, come on, come on, saints. Is that correct? Uh, I need to know you're in this class with me. All right? So that was prophetic concerning the, the, the death of Jesus. Then Jesus shows up, and he has to fulfill the principle of the spotless lamb. Because if Jesus had broken the principle of the spotless lamb, even if the day of the Lord came, and there was no spotless lamb to present, then the day would be lost. But his people will be willing in the day of his power. All right? So Jesus shows up and he breaks the power of sin. Now there are two dimensions of the manifestation of the power of sin. Sin in the seed or sin as 
Seen, seen in the seed and then seen in the action. Right? So seed in the seed is actually revealed in the fact that we were all conceived in sin, not because all of our fathers were fornicators and adulterers, but because the nature of sin, which was passed in Adam, just came in the seed. And so man was born with the nature of sin. Do you understand that? And to beat that, God had to play a fast one on Satan and give the seed that formed Jesus. So we know that the seed of Adam was not involved in the formation of Jesus. Does it make sense? Come on, does it make sense? Good. But you know that sin in the nature is not the only thing responsible for sin in the action. I hope you know that. For years in church, we thought, we thought that man could sin because he had a sin nature. Now that's not entirely true. Is anybody waking up right now? The sin nature is not entirely responsible for sin. For instance, Adam and Eve sinned without the sin nature. And Jesus in Matthew chapter 4 was tempted to sin without the sin nature. That's the reason why born again believers still sin without the sin nature. There's another principle responsible for sin apart from the mortal body. Right? Which is lost. Lost is not present in your body because of sin. Because of the... Every lost present in your body is actually representative of some beautiful creation of God that he created for you to enjoy. All that Satan does with a lost is to draw it into realms that God did not intend it to operate in. All right? For instance, the sexual lust was created by God for beautiful purposes. But when Satan draws a man's attention in the direction of a woman who has no business with that lust, Oh, come on. We can take it from the beginning. Oh. So Eve knows what the word of the Lord is, created in the very image and the likeness of God, carrying the seed of God, and then Satan says, did God say you should not? Then suddenly he draws her attention into dimensions of that thing that God didn't want her attention in. Did you know that if you eat this thing, you will become like God, knowing good from evil? The moment it became interesting to her, Without the nature of sin, Eve sinned. So Matthew chapter 4 was not some drama in the wilderness. It wasn't like Jesus saying, come on, come on, come on, come on, pass. I know your tricks. No, that's not it. We cannot call it a temptation according to James, except we are drawn by lust. It means that Jesus was interested in every one of those things that Satan presented before him. Can I skip that part? Can I skip that part? Oh, oh, someone just said no. James said, let none of you when you are tempted say, I'm tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither does God tempt anyone with evil. He said, but you are tempted when you are drawn of your own lust. Are you following me? And then lost, when it develops, gives birth to sin. It then means that the presence of desire is not sin. Genesis chapter 4 helps us understand it. Cain was already angry with Abel because God had accepted the sacrifice of Abel and God had not accepted the sacrifice. Do you remember that story? You remember that story, right? Good. But when God shows up, God didn't say sin has overtaken you. Cain was already in rage. He already was plotting. And then God shows up and says, Cain, why are you angry? If you had done right, would you not have been acceptable? He said, but now sin is, is at your door. It's, it, it's right around. He said, its desire is to have you. He said, but you must rise and master it. That's part of the reasons why one of the gifts that the Holy Spirit births in us is called self-control. 
so that, listen to me, there's no day you get so born again you don't get angry. No day you get so born again that you don't feel like entering to territories that are not yours. I mean that in every sense of the word. What you do with that feeling is what makes you born again. Yep. It's what proves the worth of your salvation. Are we together? Uh, so don't, don't, don't even feel like somebody, is there somebody who feels like the headquarters of temptation is actually in front of the house? Like, oh God. Oh, which I do this game now. Why should they always call here? Why is this guy always showing me where his money is? Not right now. Now that I'm broke, no. Maybe you even pulled the drawer. Oh God. Oh God. Oh, God. Oh. And one of the things that God does to give you mastery over every kind of sin is to permit the sin around you. That's why Jesus will take the purse and give it to Judas. Salah. Only God does that. Aha. One of the only ways to get you to, because did they give me that scripture in Genesis? They said you must rise up and master it. It means you can gain mastery. To move on and out. And many times in gaining mastery, you must understand the principles of grace. You must understand the principles of grace. You must never be ashamed to say, Lord, help me. There are none of us that gain so much mastery that we forget that we need help. Actually, mastery is I need help. Are you with me? So, so let's move on, right? So I was talking about Psalm 110. He will send the rod of his strength out of Zion with one declaration ruled down. So principal prophecy, that's how we got there, right? So God deals with the seed of sin by permitting Mary to give birth to Jesus without without the seed of Adam. Is that right? And every one of us, according to Peter, are born again. What happens is whatever effect the seed of your father has in your mortal body is canceled. The real problem is that the feeling of those activities are seated in your soul are still alive. But your body loves righteousness. Now I'm realizing my journey is far, so I need to move a bit faster, yeah? Because we're going to redemption. That's what happens at born again. But then secondly, Jesus stands in front of several opportunities to sin and then leaves without sin. It's the principle of the Passover I'm showing you, apart from the prophecy of the Passover. Right? And then he arrives at this point where he's now the spotless Lamb of God. Now let me say something to you. If Jesus had died in August, he would have still been God's Passover lamb because the principle was fulfilled. If they had killed him in November, he would have still been God's Passover lamb because the principle was fulfilled. But because by prophecy, God already spared out a day that he called uh, the Passover. Just to reveal his sovereignty, he sat down even in the midst of the darkness to orchestrate that the darkness causes that Jesus is hung on the tree on the past overnight. Supposing that a year is a lifetime, there was a one over 365% chance only that Jesus could have died on a Passover day. How coincidental could that have been? Well, I hope somebody heard me in mathematics. So that it tells you that the darkness is not far from God. Right? No. Even the things that happen in secret places are added to the prophetic but not within the context of the prophetic in the will of God, but the prophetic. Listen to me. Please, let me. The prophetic within the context of the sovereignty of God. 
hear me. So, while the church thinks that what God should have done, let me use America now, I'm tired of using Nigeria. Tiffany's here. Let I know that I understand global politics. Not you think so. <laughs> Listen. So, while God speaks to the church in America, for instance, and there's the whole division, God, by whatever means, wanted his church siding with him, even if he knew. Can I say it again? So many of us do, especially political choice, like who is going to win? Let me know where to throw my vote. No, church people don't vote to win. We vote to align with the will of God. That it might be known in the heavens that God still has men on the earth. So if God's candidate was the most unpopular What's the name of this guy who came out? This independent Kanye West. If Kanye was the sorry, if Kanye was the choice of God, I'd go for that election. I stand on the line all day to vote Kanye, knowing that he's gonna lose. Listen. And the prophetic within the context of the sovereignty of God is not always given to be known. It was the Lord Jesus who proved that in, in Acts chapter 1. They said to him, will you at this time again restore the kingdom to Israel? Then Jesus said, of the times and the seasons reserved in the Father. No man knows, not even the Son. Uh, uh, uh. Did you just hear that? I'm sure that many Christians read that line in Acts chapter 1 and they believe that Jesus was just trying to be conservative or diplomatic with his answer. Come on, guys, don't, let's not discuss this matter. I know it, but I don't think I should tell you. No, no. Jesus meant it when he said, concerning the times and the seasons reserved in the Father. It then means, hear me, that the sovereignty, the, the operation of the prophetic in the sovereignty of God is always hidden in the Father. And the father chooses when and to whom to reveal it. And most times, that context is revealed only to those who can keep God's secret. No, you didn't hear me. It means that if God gave that revelation to somebody, he's not likely going to be telling it on the street. But the prophetic according to the will of God is, you say you want a king, like the other nations, do you understand the implication? Do you understand that he's going to turn your children into slaves? Do you get that this is the kind of pain that is going to come? We just want a king. The other nations. Have your way. And yet, within the context of the sovereignty of God, the king of God had been prophesied by Jacob in Genesis 49 to come out of Judah the lion and the lion's whelp. And so there was no prophecy on Saul or Benjamin. But because Israel insisted before time for a king, ah, God had to give them the best among them. Head and shoulder taller than everybody. He looked like a king. Except that it takes God to war and form the heart in a king. Amen. You got that part, right? So I can move on. The prophetic and the principle. You got it, right? Good. The second one I have spoken about would have been Pentecost, 50 days later, which is a feast God established. So that after seven sevens, that seven Passovers, they stand and declare their liberty again in a feast called Pentecost. And actually, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So Pentecost was actually talking about the Holy Spirit from when God initiated the feast. And yet, the principle for the release of the Holy Spirit is in Psalm 133 from verse 1. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together. Come on, come on, come on. Come on. Are, are you getting lost in service? We just started. Dwell together in unity, for it is like the oil flows from the head of Aaron, all right? 
flows from the head of Aaron, running down on the bed. Okay. It is like the precious oil, what? Upon the head of Aaron. L listen, it's not oil poured on the head of Aaron. It is that the oil had always been on the head. It was time for the oil to run down the body. Until we put the body together in one accord, until it agrees, the oil does not run down. So Jesus said, I'll go to the Father and I'll ask him. But what will be responsible is one accord. 43 days after Jesus died, listen to me. 50 days after his death was supposed to be the feast, the natural feast called Pentecost. We know that it took him three days in the grave and then he resurrected. And then the Bible says he was seen for 40 days after his passion. So it meant that it was 43 days after his death that he stood upon the Mount of Olives. And then he looked at them and he said to them, you guys wait in Jerusalem until you be end endued with power. And you receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And then these guys go to Jerusalem. Then the Bible says, Acts chapter 2 verse 1, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, the prophetic, they were in one accord, in one place, the principle. The people are willing. The day of his power, the people are willing. Are we together? Are we together? Do you get that? Good. So, add to that Psalm 24, right? That God makes a claim, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the worlds and they that dwell therein, right? For he has founded upon the floods and established upon the seas. Then he said, who shall ascend? And in asking who shall ascend, what he was actually simply saying is, who will I give the authority of the earth to? Are we together? He, 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 he. Are we together? The earth still belongs to me. Forget about the way it is going. The earth still belongs to me. Forget about who wins the election. The earth still belongs to me. Forget about what's happening on the streets and how many people were killed on October 20th. The earth still belongs to me. It then means that God's real drive, please hear this, because where we're running to is redeeming creation. God's real drive is, is not claiming the earth. It belongs to him. Is who can I trust enough to reclaim the earth for me. Ooh. Can I say it again? God's real problem is not reclaiming the earth. Listen. Wars comes to us. And that's also contained in the, in the prophecy. He looks at the earth. Cleans it. Starts again. And the prophecy also contains that. A day is surely going to come. When he's going to have to do that. But before that day and that time comes. Before that day and that time comes, in the prophecy, I wish, I wish we could take these prophecies one after the other. It's just that I'm, I, I, I can't trust you right now. You look like you're going to get lost. Someone who is. In the prophecy, there was what Jesus said when he said, a good man sowed upon his field. And then at midnight, while men slept, an enemy came and sowed tears in the midst of the wheat. And then when they began to grow, the servants of that man came up and said, was it not good we sowed here? How come there are tears in the midst of it? And the master wasn't in doubt. He just said to them, an enemy has done this. Then they gave him an easy solution. Why don't we just go up right now, like every agriculturist does, um, and pick out the tears so that only the wheat will grow. And then he says, no, let them grow together. And people read that and they think it was a parable as in a story. It was a prophecy. Jesus was simply saying that the earth was created by God for the best good of everyone who was to dwell on it. And then Satan sowed in principle and then instead of God cutting it up from the very beginning, that he might be justified when he judges. Because if he had cut it up from the very beginning, he would have been using his power arbitrarily. And the principle of the word of God is the fact that God himself subjects himself to his principle, not because he doesn't have the power to override his principle, but because he has chosen by his sovereignty to reveal everything he wants you to be by being it. Uh -uh. I'll say it again. Or did you get it? 
You got it right? Because I asked that question as a child too, too many times. Why didn't God just cut this thing off from the beginning? Because save us trouble. But the thing is, if he had done that, he would be exercising his powers beyond the boundary of the principles he had set. The deepest principle of God, the Bible says the throne of God is established upon righteousness and justice. So if anybody sees differently from God, God is not justified by striking him. God permits that thought to thrive so that he can cause God's thought to also thrive beside that thought as the judgment of that thought. So that in the day when God says to that thought, I bind you, even the thought agrees. Nobody will stand the judgment of God and feel unfairly treated. Nobody. If anyone got to heaven and they, told, they showed him the road to hell, even he will agree. Before they point the road, you tell them, I know where I'm going on this road. I know. I know. That he might be justified when he judges. Could he have? Yes. Did he? No. By what principle? By the principles of divine justice. Listen to me. I, I trust the Lord to quicken your understanding. Because if you are able to aggregate all of the things that you are hearing this morning your perspective of what happens in the earth will change suddenly so i laid down last night and mourned for america and i mourned for the world and i said to the lord lord so what's the plan now it didn't mean anybody who pointed out where god was standing was wrong I read a preacher last night on Facebook saying, well, I told everyone Biden was going to win. And now most of the top preachers I listened to prophesied that Trump was going to win. What do I do with their books now? I wanted to say to him, send them to me. Send them to me. Because I looked at him and I had compassion. He feels like we're in a football game here. Asana has won. We told you our club will win. I wish it was about club. No, do you remember how glad we were in 2015? Finally, the progressives have come. Now, the progressives are killing us at left. We are progressed. If Nigeria has not learned a lesson, we should learn not to judge by the seeing of the eyes. If you heard me this morning, let's solve that part first. It makes you a lot more discerning. It even makes that you enter seasons like that with a lot of... Listen to me. Every God is interested in political power, economic power, and social influence. Every God. In fact, what makes any throne a throne in the spirit is how much of this tree it controls in the natural. That's also the reason why you must be rich. Now, it's not because of the house and the car. It's because of the warfare. Who controls the resources or who controls who controls the resources controls the earth. <laughs> Did you hear me? Who controls who controls the political power? Controls the earth. Who controls who controls the social influence? Controls the earth. It's part of the reasons why, let me say this clearly to believers, it is not spirituality to love obscurity. You must be comfortable in obscurity, especially when he's lighting your lamp. But nobody lights a candle to hide it under a bush. Do you get it? God cannot spend so much time teaching you his kingdom, strengthening you in the knowledge of his kingdom, only so that you can hide somewhere. You know, I just, I'm just a Christian. I, I don't like to be proud. I don't know anybody know me. You know, I, just, I, just, I like underground work. No, please get out of that underground. Do some overground work now. 
Does anybody get what I'm saying? Your absence on that top of the hill causes that the earth is the way that it is. And because you are not on the top of that hill, anything that looks like it is on top of any hill, did you hear that in that day the mountain of the Lord's house shall be exalted above the hills? It means that the mountain of the Lord's house is not the only existing mountain. Can I offend you a bit? Can I offend you a bit? Uh, I, I was speaking to our church in Zaya. Yeah. And I said to our church in Zaya, Zachariah chapter 4, the hand of Zerubbabel has laid the foundation for this tem temple to me. And his hand will also complete it. I said to them, one of the things we must pray for in the midst of this NSAS movement, is anybody hearing me? Is that God will cause that only those who are born out of Zion will end up at the top of the movement. The reason is because Nigeria is not saved because we move power from an older generation to a younger generation. Nigeria is only saved if we move power out of the hand of Satan into the hand of those who understand God, his kingdom, and its principles. If not, forgive me. Sorry will become your next icon. And what that will create. I'm going to say something, Tiffany. I don't know whether you'll agree with me or not. When the Black Lives Matter movement began in America, one of the things I said to our church, you know, I, I'm just one hidden prophet inside one coro. I'm not even in Lagos, so not too many people hear me. And I like it. I should not be hidden a bit. I should not like obscurity. I just preached it. Oh, Lord. Is this a, the, see, my word is coming against me. Pia is happy to hear that. She's been doing her best to get me out. I, I said that. <laughs> when the Black Lives Matter movement came up, I said to our church, every life matters. Every life. And I'm not given to the segregation and all the things, but listen to me. There is something foundationally, and it was the Holy Ghost who, who showed me. I, didn't, I don't have the capacity in myself to think. I'm not that smart. I'm not. I've told everybody. The Holy Spirit told me that the foundation upon which the black community was declared to have been set free in America was actually the problem. The kind of people that began to icon freedom for the black race in the world was part of the problem. So guys like Bob Marley showed up and they shouted, emancipate yourself from mental slavery. None but ourselves can free our mind. I got no people atomic energy, but none of them can stop the time. How long shall they kill our prophets while we stand aside and look? Oh, sorry, I was coming from there. Yeah, I go, I go finish though. But Mali used to be my mentor. Uh, I don't look like it here, because hear this, because you see. Do you understand now why the Bible says walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise? Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Redeeming the time does not mean make the most of every opportunity. Use your time well. No, that's not redeeming the time. Because it started by saying walk circumspectly, meaning there are certain steps you can't take. Why? Because the days are evil. It means if you made the mistake of instead of taking this step, taking this one, you will be captured within the evil of the day. This morning, the Holy Spirit reminded me that the Lord Jesus said, if the days were not shortened, even the elect, it means the power to discern the machinations of evil within the context of the present time is not given to observation. You can't discern it by looking. A day is going to come that the only way you can survive the workings of Satan is to serve the Lord. Let me give you a counsel I don't give carelessly. Together with your personal prophetic, find a trusted prophet. Do you hear me? So that in the days when you are confused, when I say a trusted prophet, I'm talking about, you know, there are three, 
three recommendations by God in Hebrews 13 for you to choose any spiritual leader. Any. Three recommendations. Number one, he must be, he must have an accurate understanding of the word of God. Right? He said, consider them who, who have the rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you. Number two, he said, whose faith follow? It means that you must look at the man and he's living by the faith he preaches, both in character and in his ability to, out of that realm of faith, believe God for the impossible. Are you following me? I'll tell you what killed Nigeria. Eh, sorry, what killed the church in Nigeria in 2019? Trust me. Don't, don't I do it. Just trust me. What killed Nigeria, the Nigerian church in 2019 was not the absence of the word of the Lord. I say it with all due respect. Most of our senior pastors and prophets knew what God was saying. They just didn't see the possibility of it working out the way God said it. So they went for the easy option. No, 2019. 2019. The re-election. God had a will. It was neither Buari nor Atiku. It was a new day. <laughs> Most of our senior men of God knew it. But the courage to speak it the faith to dare to believe it. Like I said to you, we do politics like we're doing man you asena. So what if I say and it doesn't come to pass? Huh? We were in a meeting recently with my friend, Bishop Wale Ajayi, um, Church of God Bishop. Right? Bishop Wale is married to the last daughter of the Archbishop Benson Dowser. And he's at the Miracle Center now. We a meeting just two weeks ago, Gombe. And Wale said something that will never leave me in my lifetime, Pastor Ike. He said, a prophet is not one who speaks and it comes to pass. He quoted a scripture. I wish, I wish I could remember it. Ah, oh, I have it written somewhere. It'll take us time. In that scripture in Deuteronomy, he said that even if a prophet speaks and it comes to pass, but leads the heart of the people away from God, that prophet is a false prophet. Uh -huh. So what was your criteria for judging the prophetic? That was the man of God that said it, then it happened. This is the man of God that said it, then it did not happen. That's why you are where you are. This is not a football game. I need to move, yeah? Ah. That's all booming. God is about to change something in this nation. I, I heard your prophetic word and thank you for yielding to God to say those things just now. Something is about to change. I have told everybody who cares to believe. There's a new day reserved for Nigeria in the sovereignty of God. I'm not just talking about in the will of God. In the sovereignty of God. There's a new day reserved for Nigeria. In the if it was just in the will of God, I'll have joined you to port. You know what I mean? I'll go port. If it was just the will of God, you know, I told you prophetic at two levels. The will of God, God wants the good of every nation. And every time God speaks, he's pointing towards the good of that nation. But in the sovereignty of God, there's a new day waiting for Nigeria. That one, even the darkness will walk together to butt it. Oh, so I was talking to you about the Black Lives Matter movement. Ah, thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you. He always reminds me, you know. So, God showed me that foundationally, the icons we had for it, Bob, the Bob Malis and all that and all that, there were only few icons like, the, like Martin Luther King Jr. who spoke 
the liberation of the black race without adding to it some colorations, some machinations. That spirit of rebellion came together with that quest for liberty. So what happened was years after, when we would have continued a fight in righteousness for just space to showcase the beauty and the glory of God in the black race. What then happened was we embraced the rebellion as a lifestyle. So we were more prone towards gangsterism. We were more prone towards... So I said to them, even the righteous policeman in America sees a black man packed. And the thought is anything is possible with this guy. He can be holy God. So not everybody who killed a black man killed a black man because he hated black people. There were people who killed black people because of the thought. It was Ben Carson I heard say this a few years ago. He said, you be true to yourself, black man. If someone walked into your office dressed the way you dress, would you be able to take up a managerial position and give to the person. All tattooed up. Because we made gangsterism look desirable. Ah, one thing we taught white people was gangsterism. They, those guys didn't understand what it means to be gangster. So God began to call my attention to the fact that the foundational figures for this movement towards the liberation of Nigeria must be that as soon as Zion Tabir, she brought forth. It must be that the hand of Zerubbabel, because the foundation for all of this trouble happening in this nation was not laid by the people who are leading the trouble. It was laid by the prayer of the church. And God must begin to raise men. I don't insist that they must come out of the church, but he must raise men whose entire lives are worthy of emulation. If not, what we will be birthing next will be worse than where we are coming up from. Does anybody understand? So, I'll go back to what I said earlier. Yeah, there's a mountain of the Lord standing there, up and tall. And the moment God plants any man on the top of that mountain, he causes every other heel to flow to him. Are you following me? Are you following me? And sometimes God doesn't even take the office itself, like the office of the president, like the office of the governor or the mayor. Or he doesn't take the office itself. Sometimes what he needs to do is to plant a true son of Zion whose life will command the authority, will command the authority. So like Joseph became a god to Pharaoh. Like Daniel became a god. Daniel was made a literal god in Babylon. He was worshipped. That's the reason why when we said some years ago that we had Daniels in government, I told them that's not how Daniels are. When Daniels show up, Nebuchadnezzar relinquishes his power and it is what Daniel says that happens. You can't have a muted Daniel. He does not exist. It's not in the Bible. You get it? So God can do Daniel. He's fine with it. As long as he, the, the leading thought that drives the nation comes out of the principle of the kingdom, God is satisfied. He doesn't have to have the chair. Yeah, yeah. God, God doesn't need the chair. He just needs the leading thought. The kingdom is in thought. So let me establish how do we get to the leading thoughts, all right? So Psalm 24, um, he now says who will ascend the mountain of the Lord. Because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof is the one who knew where he planted the, the foundations of it. So who will climb the mountain of the Lord? Who will ascend to his hill? Who, who will God entrust the destiny of the earth to? He that had clean hands and a pure heart, who had not lifted up his soul unto vanity, or whose soul does not respond consistently to vain things. Nor sworn deceitfully. That's who walks in truth. Then the Bible tells you in verse 5. That this man will receive the blessing from the Lord. 
Uh, what, 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 what verse is that? No, no, no. Take me to KJV. I'm seeing NKJV on that. You King James? Oh, it's not the same with King James. Come on. King James version. That's the version we'll be reading in the Bible. In heaven. I'll get to heaven. If you don't hear thou, just know that guy. You came to the wrong branch of heaven, yeah? Okay. KJV. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord. Yeah, that's it. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. What is the blessing? The blessing of Abraham is in you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Galatians chapter 4 establishes that in you shall all the families of the earth be blessed was unpacked in Jesus, not in Isaac. Are you with me? Oh, God. The, the yes, the yes, eh? Feels like, I should say, let's share the grace. All right. So, the blessing is in you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Galatians chapter 4 reveals that that's not in Isaac. That is in Jesus. And in the blessing, all right? Go to Romans chapter 4. Let me show you. Let me show you what's written there. Romans 4. Go there with me. I ascend this holy mountain. Ah, yeah. Verse 13. 413. What's the promise? The promise of the blessing is this. For the promise that he should be what? No, no. Okay. It's, it's on the board. If you have not found it in your own Bible, you can just look at the board. For the promise that he should be what? Of what? That means that God intended for the seed of Abraham to inherit the world he has made. So the promise that we will inherit the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, that is Isaac, but through the righteousness of faith, which is Jesus. It means that, please hear this, before Jesus returns, you remember I told you the prophecy that you call a parable, yeah? The parable of the wheat and the tares. Do you remember? Good. What did the master say? Follow the story. He said, wait until the harvest. Meaning that within the context of the knowledge of God, he knew that the presence of the tear sold by the enemy was not going to stop the seed from producing. That in the very end, the wheat will produce at its highest capacity. Then he said, wait till the end. Then I will send angels into the harvest. First, to cut off the wheat, all right? Or to harvest the wheat. Let's use the word harvest. That's the first thing. They'll gather the wheat. Then he said, the remaining chaff, he will burn in everlasting fire. Hear this. It then means that the harvest of the wheat has to precede the burning with fire. And that what will qualify, because the moment you take away wheat from any farmland, what is left is not profitable for anything, you burn it. It then means that in this war between good and evil on the earth, let me break your heart. Good will never win. Please get it within the right context. I'm not saying no nation will elect a right president. You will never make a right choice. No. Good will never win in the sense that there will be no day we will wake up and everybody accepts the God position. Which was ultimately the intent of God. Are you following me? God is not willing that any should perish. Recently, I started to see how the goodness of God. The goodness. Hey, can I offend one doctrine you have always heard? Don't worry. It was the Holy Ghost that also offended me. How did the Father love for us? Hold a G, please. Ah, you have been straining me all day. I've been wondering why. Ah. How did the Father Oh, yeah. I've asked beyond all this. Ah, that he should give his only son. <laughs> My voice is back. Make a wretch his treasure. Uh -huh. Hear me. Somebody needs to understand how good God is. God is not willing that any should perish. I need to take this detox so that you can hold it in your heart. There's not a man God has made 
that he destined for destruction, not one. Let me tell you how bad it is. P.I., when God revealed this to me, it changed my perception of the sinner. How much God loves the sinner? Jesus, in John chapter 1, called himself the light that lightens every man that comes into the world. Then in 1 John chapter 4, I believe, or, or 5, I've written unto you these things, beloved, that you do not sin. But if any man sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, who is the propitiation for our sins, and not only for our sin, but for the sin of the whole world. 2 Corinthians 5.19 To with God was in Christ Jesus, reconciling the world to himself not imputing their trespasses against them. That means God has no record of any man's sin after Christ. This is the one that shocked me. Have you been in a crusade before and they said, when they were asking you to give your life to Christ, they said that you should say, write my name in the book of life. Has anybody been there? Have you heard it before? Have you heard it before? I found out recently that it's not in the Bible. No, no, I just found out. Not too long ago, so don't look at me like a superstar. He taught me. I read Revelation chapter 3. You can find it. I guess that will be verse 5. I read Revelation chapter 3, and I find there that the Bible says, and to whosoever overcometh. Huh? Right? He that overcometh. I will grant that he be clothed in white raiment, and that his name will not be blotted out of the book of life. That means, Pastor Bumi, you heard it. It means that from the day a man is born, out of the faith and the faithfulness of God, he writes his name in the book of life. A man's name is not written in the book of life when he gives his life to Christ. The day the man dies as a sinner, God painfully blots out the name. That's how much hope God has in saving the world. So, the next time you sing, Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. The first day I heard that song was in this song. That your last meeting. Oh, it chases me down. Fight still and found. It was your meeting now. Leaves the 99. When you hear that, I heard Tiffany's testimony this morning, and I'm so blessed. Without a preacher in the bathroom. That's when I realized that the ministry of the Holy Spirit does not start when you gave your life to Christ. Jesus said, when he comes, he, the spirit of truth, he will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. That means every unbeliever has the Holy Ghost talking to him. The only thing is that between the unbeliever and the Holy Spirit, all the directions are leading towards repentance. So you find people like Cornelius without giving their lives to Christ, getting accurate prophetic words to the street where he would find Peter. You get it. That's how much. But, but amazingly, in the context of the sovereignty of God, the battle to win everyone will never happen. Listen, that's not to discourage you. Because remember I told you that your operation is not according to the sovereignty, the knowledge of the sovereignty of God. Your operation is according to the knowledge of the will of God. Are you following me? So everyone you find who is lost, you will do everything that is available to you. I didn't say God has predestined certain people for hell. That's not what I said. I just said some people will surely make the choice to end up in hell. Even though God has got good plans for them. Does it make sense to you? Good. Now let's push into redemption. Let's push into redemption. A few more minutes and I'm out of your face. I'll do my best. I, I hope you were blessed. Yeah? I hope you were blessed. Did you see something this morning? Great. Then we can return to where I said, we ascend, yeah? So, who will ascend the hill of the Lord? 
And I said to you, that heel is above every other heel. So that when that heel is established, then the man who stands upon that heel becomes the icon or the representation of what the kingdom of God is supposed to look like. Then all other heels will flow onto him. In fact, in Micah's prophecy, Micah said that there will be some people who will flow to that heel who would say, we will not serve your God, but we will leave his ways. right now what is the implication of this on creation i'll tell you what the implication is romans chapter 8 father oh what love you have lavished on me a mortal to be called your to share your image divine. I in Romans chapter 8. Uh, let's start from verse 14. 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Are you still here? Come on, saints. Are you still here? All right. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Verse 15. 15 for you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear but you have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry our father please hold on the word adoption here is not your english word adoption you know the english word adoption means you were not a child and then somebody went out um borrowed you and added you to the family yeah but the word adoption here is the third dimension of great uh, of third dimension of spiritual growth within the Israeli context. The three dimensions of spiritual growth are first, the circumcision, second, the bar mispa that happens at the age of 12, and then third and finally, which is what happened to Jesus at the age of 30, is adoption. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And at the point of adoption in the Hebrew culture, hear me, everything the father has becomes the property of the son. So the son receives at 30 what is now called the signet, the right to transact any business on behalf of the father with or without the father's consent. We see that in the life of Jesus. So in John, it, no, that's not John 5. I think, yeah, that, that's John 5. In John chapter 5, the Bible says, as, as the father has life in himself, so has he given to the son to have life in himself. Then you travel a few verses down, and then you will find out, please hear this, you will find out that the Lord Jesus said that the son can of himself do nothing. It is what he sees the father doing. Now, that is the son declaring to you that he has found in the father the most accurate pattern to live by. I need to slow down there. Listen to me. When I joined marriages like the one I joined last week Saturday, right? I was supposed to do one yesterday. The circumstances overtook me. When I joined marriages, one of the words that I emphasize every time is the word live. And I tell them, because of African culture, many people don't even see what scripture says. The Bible says, therefore shall the man live. It means that the woman is not married to be added to the man's family. Yeah, 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 yeah. The Bible says you have made the word of God vain by your tradition. So you go for African weddings and you find the father of the girl crying. The mother of the girl, hey, my daughter, you are leaving us today. That thing that we have taught you, just keep it. Obey us, man, oh. We don't want you to come back. The reason is because there's that feeling of loss that comes with giving out a daughter. And we did not actually realize that that culture has no basis in Christ. That in Christ, the reason why a woman will leave is because the man has left. And that living, that word leave is what makes for adoption. That's why I started it. So the day a man is declared, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. It is declared that the man has left. But, oh God. Do you now realize why Ephesians chapter 5 said, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and be cleave to his wife, but 
Behold, I saw you a great mystery, but I speak, I, I'm not speaking about husbands and wives. I'm talking about Christ and his church. What was saying is that the reason why Christ left the Father was so that he can become one with us. And that leaving, that separation that came between Christ and the Father had one intent only, so that he can adopt a wife upon whom he can bestow the honors of the Father. I'll tell you. Do you understand it? So the woman only lives to keep to a man who has left. And at the point of the adoption, which is leaving, hear this. At the point of the adoption, it now becomes the prerogative of the son to turn back and look at his father and agree in his heart whether or not he wants to live by the principles he saw his father live by. So that, humanly speaking, if the father has had many mistakes in his life, it is adoption that permits the son to turn back and say, no, my father treated his wife like this. I ain't going to treat my wife like this. Yeah? My father raised his children like this. I have traveled long enough to find out that this is the effect of how my father raised me. I wouldn't raise my children that way. So the right to decision is given when adoption happens. <laughs> ah, I wish I could talk about the prophecy in Revelations. The two witnesses, Elijah and Moses. The freedom from Babylon and the freedom from Egypt. And the Bible says it is in Babylon and Egypt where Jesus was crucified. It tells you that it wasn't speaking about location. It was talking about a working. Travel. There's a meeting tomorrow evening. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Ah, tomorrow evening. Tomorrow evening. Ah, tomorrow evening. Ah, thank you, Lord. I'm so happy to hear that. Are the eyes of your understanding getting enlightened? It's very important. So at the point of adoption, please follow me. Because it's the redemption of creation we want to discuss. At the point of adoption, what the son says stands. It's not this one that children are married. 45 year old man. His mother is still calling from village. Well now, have the children gone to school? Your wife, has she woken up? You have you eaten? I hope you are not eating garlic consistently. What you lack is adoption. Aha. Uh -huh. I'm raising the volume. If your husband is still talking to his mother, hey, Mama, oh, I miss you. <laughs> Lack of adoption. No, I'm not saying it's wrong for him to miss his mother. I'm talking about the spirit with which he does it. Now, at the point of adoption, ah, the child now has the right, sir, to choose whether he wants to live according to the pattern he has seen in the father. So when, when scripture said, as the father has life in himself, so has he given to the son to have life in himself. What Jesus was saying is, now I have arrived at adoption. And yet, by choice, the son can of himself do nothing. It is what he sees the father doing. Meaning the, the, the pattern from which I was adopted. Ah, you didn't get it. The pattern. That's the reason why the word is pattern. Is pata. That's where father is gotten from. I already told you. Who's your paternal grandfather? That's pata. It's, a, it's the structure. Jesus was simply saying, I've looked at the entire structure that the heavenly father has that gave birth to me. And I have realized that I cannot add to it. I can't take away from it. So I don't need to struggle. I don't have to find any new principles to live by. One day I was teaching parenting and I said to them, my, my greatest heart desire will be for my son. To be able to say like Jesus. As the father has life in himself. 
so as he given to the son to have life in himself, independence of thought. Right? And yet, the son can of himself do nothing. It will mean at that point that I have been able to provide excellent father. Those are the restorations we must believe God for. A son is not supposed to be looking for patterns to love with. He's supposed to look at how his father loves his mother. He's supposed to look at how his mother responds, or she's supposed to look at how her mother responds to her father. And she knows that is sufficient to live by for the rest of her life. No matter what philosophies are born on the earth, she's not shifting to the left or to the right because she has looked at the pattern and haven't looked at him. She has said to herself, we can't add to this. It's part of the reasons why I recommend, especially for those of you who are young girls, I also recommend it to young boys, but especially those of you who are young girls. Hear me. When you depart from your biological father, especially when you begin to see things that are wrong with his patterns, patterns. Look for a spiritual father who has what it takes to provide for you that pattern. Don't look for an abusive man. Look for a spiritual father. Look for a father. You need a father. You need to be able to see what it ought to be. Makes your journey easier. While those of us who are fathers must be able to look up to God and say to God, Lord, I don't want to fail. I don't want to. When I started traveling a lot, it was one of the things I said to God. I said, Lord, I don't want to come back home and my children find a stranger. I don't. I don't want something to happen to my child and he doesn't have anybody to talk to because I was preaching the gospel. So I said to God, if you will settle my fatherhood, I'd face your kingdom. And he did. He did. A few weeks ago, my first daughter stood in front of my wife. And she said, mommy, you know you are so blessed. And then her mother says, why? She said, the way daddy loves you. Whatever she saw. That healed the challenge we were going through with my wife that day. My daughter didn't know we were angry. She didn't know. So he solved the matter. I saw to myself, so this anger that I'm angry now, my daughter is still looking and believing and my wife is so blessed to have me as her husband. It means that my daughter is going to get married. She's going to be looking for her father. And it's supposed to be normal. One day when I was still in Zaya, I think about seven years ago, the young boys in church came to my house. They came with the answer spirit. They came to Sorosuke. Came to speak up. About eight, nine of them just walked into my parlor and they said they wanted to see me and their countenance wasn't looking good. And I was joking with my guys and they, they just were not laughing. Joy, including your husband. Where is he? He was there that day. And you stood up the moment I said Joy. Her husband was part of the people. About eight of them walked into my house and then they sat down and then they said, sir, we have a problem. I said, what's the problem? He says, sir, all of the girls in church are not agreeing to enter into relationships with us. So I said, how is that my problem? <laughs> that's not my problem. They said, we, we sat down to discuss, and that's how we came to you right now. We figured out that they were all looking for you in us. I said, that's normal. It's normal. I said, it only tells you that I'm a good pastor. I said, if they were looking for me in the sense of achievements, then it is wrong. Because you have not traveled the journeys I've traveled. But if they were looking for me in the sense of principle, then they are right. I said, pick up the challenge. So look at me daily and see how I live and see why I live the way I live. Because if you got married to them and they walked home only to find out that you are not what I am, then you will be in trouble. It's not I am in how much money I have or how great a name I carry. And from that year till now, we have rarely had girls marry outside our church. 
There's no rule. It's not, it's not a rule. We didn't set a rule to say, ladies in God Life Assembly, you cannot marry us up. My girls marry each other. They marry each other. It's, it's strange. In fact, the last wedding we did last Saturday, P.I., the guy wasn't a church guy. He came in because he wanted this girl, and she had agreed. In fact, I had a fight with her because she had agreed. Because we have, we have parental code. You don't agree to anybody and come back home and tell us you have agreed. Because when the trouble starts, we all have to sit around the table together. So let's sit around the table before the decisions are made. And I always tell them, the only wife I can marry, I've married her. So it's not in my best interest to keep you single. And I'm not planning to kill my wife soon so that I can marry you. So it doesn't make sense. The moment you know I love you, then you should come around the table and let's talk about who you want to choose. Amen? Maybe I just saw, saw somebody's trouble, you know. And she brings in this guy. And the first day he comes to church was the day he was coming to tell me. And then he sits down in the service. And I didn't see them outside the service. I had guests. So I couldn't see them outside the service. I was in the office with my guests. And, da, 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 da. and then he came back for the next service. After the next service, when they walked in to see me, he said, Sir, I'm Daniel. I'm the one who came to marry this girl. But um, I thought that that was the reason why I came. I just came to tell you. I just found my church and I found my father. And you know, people marry girls out. My girls are marrying guys. <laughs> At that point of adoption, what happens is that the, even though the choice is yours, you can still turn back and look at the pattern that has been established. It is that point I always say to a next generation, the greatest honor you can do to a passing generation is not to, honor is not in money and gifts. Yes, money and gifts are good as a reflection of honor. Very good. And yet the highest honor you can do to a preceding generation is to look at their pattern and avoid the things to avoid and embrace the things you ought to embrace. That's the highest form of honor. If Pimo gets up today and he says, God has given him an assignment somewhere else in the world. Oman, Iraq, Kyrgyzstan, Syria. Because you know in Lagos, all of you, God is sending you to Canada, US, and the UK. So when I come to Lagos, I don't have to call those, those names. I used to call things like Kyrgyzstan, Afghanistan, Armenia, Azerbaijan. Ah! Oh, oh, Pimo has traveled there. Eh? No problem. When I grow up, I suppose are you, is anybody following me? Yeah. All of these nations are for the taking. Yeah. It's a weak generation that goes to nations that have been made. A strong generation looks for nations that have not been taken. Give me this nation. It tells you that most of our movements are for a better life, not for kingdom conquering. So Tiffany lives in the midst of answers. Ask P.I., if it was me, we would have run this conference physically. Hey, they can be fighting. I say, I'm used to it now. I come from the north. The moment he said to me, you said the Lord said to come, I just loved you with an everlasting love. I don't think there's anything you can do now for me not to love you again. Because the courage to come to a nation that is in trouble can only come upon a man because he's sent of God. That's how you separate true prophets from convenience people. The moment they say nation, okay, after answers, when we now believe that there was no hope for Nigeria, did you notice that nobody was thinking to port to Ghana? We're not thinking of Niger. It's Canada now. So all of us wanted to go to Canada. If we had our way after that week of the shooting, they would have just packed like one third of Nigeria's young people and put them in Canada. Even Canada would not know what happened to it. We just all turn around, suddenly it's a black nation. <laughs> Are you with me? I was talking to you about the adoption. I'll close there since we have a tomorrow evening session.
I continued. Tomorrow I'll just continue. Blessed are those who were not here today. Listen. So at the point of the adoption, what you have is a pattern. When Jesus came to the earth and the father declared, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. At that point, if the Lord Jesus did anything, all of heaven, that's what he was saying to Pilate. When Pilate said to him, why are you talking to me like I'm a Jewish leader? Don't you know that I can free you now and you are free? Jesus, inside blood, now laugh. <laughs> Pilate, you. <laughs> ah, you can't free me. I'm not even here because you caught me. No man takes my life from me. I lay it down. And when I choose, I pick it up again. Then he said, if help was what I was looking for, it's you who is not seen. There's a legion of angels with their swords drawn. Just wait. It was the reason why he did not open his mouth. If he had said no, angels would have acted on him. He had to go with his mouth shut. If he started more Ah, Otiku. Have you Otiku? Are you following? On his pathway, he had to keep his mouth shut. Because if he had opened his mouth, a legion of it, you don't understand the implication of a legion. It was one that cleared the firstborn of Egypt in one night. And he did it at slow pace. Ah, you are thinking? Ah, you are thinking angels move like you? They don't move like you. What? David counted the army. One angel landed Israel that night. Cleared the men. You know, the miracle was not just the one angel. How was David seeing the progression of the angel to have discerned that he can block the angel at the threshing floor of Aram? There are miracles in scripture you need to see. A thousand of that type of angels had their swords drawn because of the adoption. At the point of the adoption, you don't pray for it to be answered. You decree it comes to pass. And the earth will not close until the adoption happens. Just believe it. They said, that's what we are talking about. It is that adopted generation, past Nigeria, that have what it takes to turn and say to the wind and the sea, shut up. That's why they said, what man of man is this? Because if we read on the Romans chapter 8, and we will do tomorrow, creation was subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who subjected the same in hope. So creation is waiting for the man whose instruction they can follow. But do you remember Psalm 24? Who has not lifted up his soul to vanity? Now, Creation that is under vanity cannot respect a man who is under vanity. The man must be standing above vanity to command creation out of vanity. So the moment a man says to creation, this is the order to go. The first thing creation does is to check which man is speaking. Is there vanity in him? If they see vanity in him, they know there's no hope here. That's why it is the man who ascends the heel of God that will ultimately bring redemption to creation. I said in that day, the man does not pray and it is answered. The man decrees and it comes to pass. So John 11, Jesus stood in front of the grave of Lazarus and said, Father, I thank you because you hear me always. I said, but for their sake that they might believe. That's adoption. What we must cry for is the adoption. Abba! Give me back that scripture on the board. Let me close. We've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. Romans 8, 15. But we have received the spirit of adoption. Whereby we cry, Abba! That's the groan. The groan is, Lord, when will we arrive? This one does not come by believing. It comes by becoming. Ah, we will see that tomorrow. Them that he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. That the son might be the first adopted among many other brothers who will be adopted. 
the day the earth is waiting for, the day of the final witness, is the day of the adoption. God is getting set in heaven now by the prophetic to release adopted sons. And in their day, every prayer is answered. If they make the mistake and tell you blind, before they finish it, you have, you have lost your sight. It's part of the reasons why, uh, I pray that your heart will believe this, it's part of the reasons why in the most recent seasons, it seems like God is withdrawing authority from the word of the church. It is because if he does not do it, it will not provoke us to desire the adoption that gives us the right to liberate creation. Now you know that the Father, who is the all-wise God, the all-righteous God, every good thing lies in him, will not declare adoption over a son who has not exalted him in his eyes to know that there is no principle he needs to live by that is outside the principle that is found in him. That's why it seems like it is taking heaven so long to trust a generation with the adoption. And yet, in the prophecy, the adoption must happen. It is when that happens, then Habakkuk 2.14 comes to pass. That the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover the earth. See, I'm of the school of thought that believes that when adopted sons rise, we don't need 10 years on the earth. We don't even need one year. I think that we need some one month, five, five days to just set everything in order and call the attention of all things created, men and beasts alike, to look up and see their salvation. It will be like Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness again. Even so, must the son of man be lifted up. That's how it's going to happen. It is going to be another suddenly. It will be a generation of people who strive consistently for clean hands, a pure heart, who have not lifted up their soul to vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. These are they that will receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of their salvation. He said, this is Jacob, the generation that seeks your face. This is Jacob. It's Jacob. Is the authority to stand over the earth. In that day, flowers will bloom again. The sea will rise again. The oceans will clap its hands again. The trees will be alive again. The ends of the earth will rejoice again. Nations will come back to life again. The order of God's rule will be established again. The beauty of God will be seen again. Righteousness, peace, and joy will be seen on the streets again. There will be shouts of joy and victory in every tent where the righteous dwells again the intent of God like it was from the very beginning oh we ascend this holy mountain ah, yeah. we ascend this holy mountain ah, now say we understand it. Say lift up your head.
His authority we are waiting for. There are realms of authority we are waiting for. It's in the adoption. It's in the adoption. Realms of authority God is about to open. Break out of us. That's why our life situations come. Just so that they can distract us. That's why they come. It's that authority they are fighting. Tonight press. Come on today. Press. 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 Tell the Lord, I desire that adoption. I desire that adoption. I desire it. That's where the freedom of all creation is. Why I said, this holy mountain. Why I said, this holy mountain. This holy mountain, I ascend. This holy mountain, I ascend. This holy mountain, I This holy mountain, I, 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 I,
this holy mountain. This holy mountain. Ah. Uh -huh. yeah. Elias. Elias. This holy mountain. This holy mountain. Ah. Yeah. Father, today we ask that you look in this room. Look upon everyone who is joining online. Everyone who will ever get to hear this message by whatever means. Look upon us, O oh God. Look upon us and stir up. Stir up the rivers within us. Stir up the circumstances around us. To push us into this adoption. For indeed, as surely as it has been spoken, it will come to pass. That the creation has not been subject to hope for nothing that surely the hope of creation will be fulfilled in those of us who will break beyond the vanity of time and see into your purpose today lord we see and yield to your purpose to the intent that your kingdom come that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven we thank you father thank you Give him thanks everywhere. Just give him thanks. Lord, we thank you for your word. For the entrance of your word brings light, oh God. And so today I ask, oh God, that your light floods the hearts of each and every one of us here, oh God. That these words are not ordinary words and they've not fallen on rocky soil. But we become the fertile ground that will start to understand the things that you're saying. Open our eyes to the things of the Spirit, oh God. That we may truly ascend into the mountains of the God and live our purpose. And have dominion upon the earth so that we can establish the kingship and the rulership of God.